Before we start with the content, I would like to give the floor to our hosts and organizers of these webinars, to Christina Molnar, Miguel Tavera, and Kadri Maripu, to welcome us for today's topic. Thank you. We start with the recording? Yes, we did. Okay, fair enough. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, welcome to this webinar. <clears throat> In the name of Salto Solidarity Corps, I would like to tell you welcome again, and I hope that you will have a really constructive one, uh, important and interesting one. One of our pillars, uh, or, or the pillars of our work is screen solidarity. And in this frame, uh, we have Euro Talk Solidarity, and we already have a little bit of a tradition of webinars in the last two years. This is the third uh, season, put it like this, and this is the second of a row of three webinars that we will do. <clears throat> so for us, is uh, solidarity, of course, important thing, and uh, solidarity is part of the European values. And one of also important European values is democracy. So democracy is a topic that we have to talk about. Next year is going to be elections in European level. And what can we do with this democracy if we don't have participation? So in this way, I give the floor to my colleague Kadri from Salto Participation and Information. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. And I extend a warm welcome to all the participants in this webinar. Uh, from Salto P team. Uh, I am Kadri Maripu and uh, Salto P is uh, hosted in a snowy uh, Estonia by Estonia National Agency. We uh, work with uh, uh, active meaningful participation and citizenship with uh, through Erasmus Plus and European Solidarity Corps programs. And uh, what I wish to maybe share with you here um, is uh, our main resource uh, that uh, we use in order to share the knowledge uh, about the participation in democratic life is the participation resource pool. Uh, so you're welcome to check it. it. There is a lot of different resources for educators, youth workers, teachers, etc. about what is participation, how to increase it in the projects as well as uh, in your work. And maybe something more, uh, there's also a call that you can see uh, Elizabeth shared, which is about uh, resources on the elections, because this is going to be our focus for the next year, uh, more in depth in, on elections. And um, with, with this webinar also the digital part, how elections are impacted by artificial intelligence, etc. So really exciting to also hear our experts talk. And maybe also for you uh, to know that there, there will be interesting uh, stories coming up in the particip participation resource pool on those topics within December, January and February. So I recommend you to check it out. But now back uh, to Krista. Thanks, Kadri, and for welcome also from my part and on behalf of Sato European Solidarity Corps. I'm very happy that we could uh, organize this webinar and especially around this topic. I'm grateful for our excellent speakers that they accepted our invitation and uh, based on their solidarity, they are spending their time with us today. Uh, and uh, especially uh, in this month, in December, which is the month of solidarity and which hosts two special days. Uh, the International Day of Volunteering and the International Day of Solidarity. And I've always been wondering what uh, the importance of giving labels to days and uh, what uh, what is the point of giving like the 500 label to, to one of the days. And uh, I realized that the point is exactly this, that I started thinking that uh, these labels, solidarity and volunteering, are concepts are values, and I start to think what these mean to me, what is my relationship with them, and what is my responsibility. And uh, when I said uh, it's the 500, it doesn't mean I don't know that the year consists of 365 days. It means that some days have, uh, sometimes they have more labels. And uh, two days ago, I crossed uh, in social media one of my uh, connections shared that uh, 5th of December was not only the day of 
uh, volunteering, but it was the day of uh, the soil. And uh, there was a nice picture with uh, uh, a piece of soil, looked like a piece of cake, which reminded me uh, our solidarity cake, where we also have the layers uh, with uh, empathy, human rights, active citizenship, and inclusion. So these values consist solidarity, they are very connected, and uh, that's why we are, as Mito and uh, Kadri said, that's why we are organizing this webinar, to see our connections to these values, to see our responsibilities. And as that picture of the soil came to me in social media, I think we all have these in our lives, and uh, digital tools, digital platforms are in our, our life. And uh, maybe this friend of mine shared this uh, information on the soil, but maybe someone I'm not connected with is sharing something on the day of cats or parks or something, but it doesn't get to me because we are not connected. So in this webinar, we will see how these concepts, network science, AI, digital tools work and how they affect our everyday lives, our decision making, and how the choices we make will affect the life of all of us and bring us or not bring us closer to democracy. So enjoy today's webinar and join us for next week also, if you're interested. Have a good time. Thank you. Thank you. So very nice words already and the topic of connection and responsibility. So I think these are two important words already that will link to um, the topic of today. Um, well, one more person uh, I want to uh, introduce to you, uh, which actually you will see the tablet from, uh, uh, Agne. She is our graphic recorder. She will draw and make it visible what we, we will be talking about. And we also will spotlight her tablet so that you can see what is happening and how it is developing and evolving during the, the next one and a half hours. So that was us. Uh, it, we would also be interested in who is here with us. Uh, we prepared a very small poll just to see um, who is with us and also your connection to AI and uh, your background. There's two small questions you should uh, see on your screen, the, the Zoom poll already. So the first question is, uh, please rate the level of your experience with AI and digital tools. It's a very open question. so. However you feel connected to it, um, let us uh, see. And answers are coming. And there is also the second question about your background. Are you consider yourself as a project manager or officer, a youth worker, a volunteer, a teacher, a researcher, or something other? And of course, you can also use the chat to specify if uh, if you want to share with us so that we have a bit of an idea who is who will be with us and who will be listening and hopefully also discussing and asking questions. Maybe while uh, the webinar and uh, while the poll is still on, uh, a connection already or an information for the questions, um, you're warmly welcome to ask questions at any time. We have two uh, options prepared for you. So you can use, of course, the chat function and we can see then the questions and answer to it. Um, or you can also use a mentee if you want to ask questions in a more anonymous way. There will be a link in the chat very soon that you can, can use. We hope for uh, an, an interactive possibility. Well, uh, a quick look. I hope you can see how the how the poll is evolving. So there's quite a mixed uh, tendency to the rate, uh, the level of experience. So uh, everything's in there from zero to four. Uh, one, two, three is a quite mixed audience. Very interesting to discuss probably. And if you look at the background, uh, quite some use workers, quite some researchers. Uh, and, and some others and volunteers and teachers so also they are very very interesting audience and people with us well that's i think that's it for the moment thanks for sharing and i i will not talk any longer because it's there is much more interesting topics to talk about and i will pass the floor 
to our first um, guest speaker. Um, he will um, abolish Lengül. Uh, please correct me. <laughs> I'm not very good at the pronunciation of the names. Um, happy that you're with us. And um, yeah, I'm curious and we are curious to hear what you have to tell us. Thank you, Elizabeth. Welcome, everyone. My name is Balázs Lengyel. Um, I'm a Hungarian living in Budapest. And uh, actually, I'm, a, uh, I'm an economic geographer interested in networks. So the topic that I would like to talk about today is, of course, about social networks and how ideas diffuse on social networks uh, or innovation diffuse on social networks and how they um, influence socioeconomic outcomes. So let me share my screen before I go any further. Good. Hope that you can see it now. So I'm going to talk about cities um, because I think, and many of us believe, that cities are major platforms and arenas of our social life. So they uh, contribute immensely to how our, our social networks evolve and how they influence um, our socioeconomic outcomes. Um, so we live in a we live in a small world, right? And this is not just a saying when we meet a stranger and we find that we have a, a, a common friend, but it's also true for social networks and, and the structure for social networks on the global level. So on this map, you see the Facebook and the guy um, uh, draw Facebook links back in 2012. And what you see here is that mo although most of the links and friendship ties are locally concentrated, we have bridges that connect these distant places and these bridges make the world very small. So it's a fact that in this, in this network, you need a very uh, small number of steps to get from one random individual on Facebook to uh, uh, another random individual on Facebook. It doesn't matter if these two individuals are located uh, on different sides of the globe. In such networks, ideas and innovation diffuse very quickly, just like viruses that we know, unfortunately. But uh, we have seen, and many uh, research has reported already, that new ideas and innovations, and actually very new innovations like ChatGPT as well, diffuses very quickly on the globe. That is partly due to the uh, small world structure of social networks. On the other hand, we also see that polarization and inequalities are growing. So here you see a picture from Mumbai in which a slum is neighbored by a prosperous area. So then the question comes immediately. If diffusion in social networks is that quick, why do we see increasing inequalities on the global scale and also within cities? So theory suggests that even though in small world networks, we form groups. And these groups determine how novelty, innovation can diffuse uh, on social networks. And if a, a group uh, or if a social network is structured by its groups, then the diffusion of, of, of innovation or novelty will increase um, uh, disparities in, in that social network. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about inequalities, inequalities in terms of uh, wealth or income of prosperity, which is one of the most uh, impactful forces uh, that shape our social networks. So the poor and the rich tend to uh, separate from one another in our social networks. And if this is the case, which is actually it is, then uh, uh, the, this type of structure will increase um, uh, inequalities, as I said before. And the, the reason for, for, for in the increase of inequalities is indeed the diffusion of ideas. So one problem uh, of, uh, of the finding empirical proof and evidence for this theory was data. We were in the, in the lucky situation to analyze a data source, a very unique data source in Hungary that can describe 
both the diffusion of novelty and also the structure of social networks and to do this uh, in the geographical space. So the opportunity was given by the data uh, that we retrieved from a social media website that was called Evid, which uh, is now closed. It's a dead website, but um, it, it was a, a, a very a novel innovation back in 2002, so way before Facebook was established. And over the years, Evid became one of the most visited, or actually the most visited website in the country. Almost 3 million users registered the profile on Ibiv. They uh, and they reported the, uh, their uh, location. We have we see the, the date of their registration, the date of last login. Uh, we see the, the, the social network and also how the website was passed over from one user to the other. I've worked a lot on this data already, of course, and we see very interesting spatial patterns. One interesting pattern is that physical barriers, such like uh, the, the Lake Balaton, which is the biggest lake in the country, divides our social relations. People on the north tend to know each other across villages, but they do not know others on the, on the southern side. You also see that administrative boundaries are important um, uh, barriers for social relations because we can group the, the towns uh, by the social network structure and then uh, the administrative barriers exactly that eliminate these, these groups. So let's see how did this uh, social network spread across geographical space. So when we see over its life cycle, we find that, of course, it uh, spread it first in the capital, Budapest, and then in big university centers, and also in the agglomeration of the capital. But when it became really viral, then it covered the entire uh, um, uh, country. Then Facebook entered Hungary in 2008. They coexisted until a while. And what you will see in the end of the life cycle that the, the, active, the, the fraction of active users decreased really quickly until only very few people used the website uh, at its latest stage. We have shown empirically that if this is true, what we see in the video, so the if so the new idea, the new innovation was adopted first in big cities and then spread to uh, small cities, and we also have shown that the spreading is uh, is not infected uh, or affected by distance in the in the early uh, phases of the life cycle, but the spreading became more and more local at later stages of the of the uh, of the website and the life cycle. So what we did is we tried to replicate the diffusion process in a network model in which you infect the nodes uh, 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 by a very uh, uh, simple model in which the probability of, of uh, uh, adopting a novelty uh, it depends on how your friends have adopted that novelty before you. We were able to replicate um, the uh, the the uh, uh, adoption dynamics not just on the country level but also on the local level so in within towns as well by fixing the social network and only um, activating the first individuals who, who adopted uh, this this innovation but we failed in some towns we failed in in those towns in which the network looked like this what you see in the video so in those towns that were fragment that have fragmented social networks, we were not able to get the the the, the time when most of the adopters, uh, no, most of the users adopted the website. Meaning that indeed uh, the structure of the social network and fragmented social networks might have an impact on how ideas diffuse um, uh, in the society. Using the same data, we also looked at how this type of structure of social networks influence socioeconomic outcomes and inequalities within these towns. So what you see in, in, this, uh, in this slide in, is that a fragmented social network is, uh, tends to be associated with higher inequalities in the town versus a more cohesive social networks, network tends to be associated with lower inequalities in these towns. And this is not just the example of these two towns that we have in the country, but we find a, um, a significant correlation 
uh, across town. More interestingly, what we have seen is that the structure of the social network also uh, influences uh, inequality dynamics. So if we have in, in fragmented social networks in, the, in those towns that are initially in unequal, then inequalities will grow, meaning that if, if, the, if the fragmentation is between the poor and the rich, then probably the social network structure will contribute to their inequalities. Why are social networks fragmented? We like to give a urban planner uh, answer to that. We have seen that those cities and towns that are fragmented by spatial barriers, meaning barriers by railroads, rivers, and main roads, tend to have more fragmented social networks compared to those towns that are not fragmented by such urban barriers. So this is probably also an urban planning question, how we can integrate society and make it make social networks more inclusive within cities. What can we do? Can bridges, so like social connections between the rich and the poor help uh, help uh, 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 mitigate inequalities. So in this classic American comedy, um, Deserving Places, Eddie Murphy gets into the high society um, by a very low probability event, right? When he meets and then Edward on the street. He, he gets into the society, learns the rules, learns how to behave in that society. And of course, in this story, we don't, do not see that this is without conflicts. But at the end, the, he manages to learn and uh, cooperate with, uh, uh, with his peer and fulfill the American dream and get rich, of course. So whether this is true in, in, in reality, we do not know. Uh, what we can do is that we can measure this data. So we, we used Twitter data in American cities to locate individuals and identify their home locations and also see their social networks. But we found that for, uh, for individuals who live in relatively poor areas and neighborhoods, the social networks tend to be spatially more concentrated, meaning that the friends of the poor lives in, 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 um, uh, in geographical proximity compared to, to the rich who have social networks uh, uh, in a bigger geographical scale. However, commuting to work uh, can, might help, and mobility of individuals within cities might help. What we see across 50 US uh, cities is that those individuals who commute a lot to their workplace manage to uh, establish more diverse networks uh, in which uh, the uh, the, the composition, the mixing of the poor and the rich is bigger. So probably they can meet uh, other individuals that are not like not like them. Uh, and uh, that type of bridging might help uh, to uh, mitigate the unequal mixture of individuals in social networks. Well, that was it. That was my story. I would like to thank uh, my co-authors who contributed to uh, these papers that I talked about. And thank you very much for your time and I'm looking for your questions. Thank you, Balas, um, for this very interesting connection about uh, the social networks, cultures and realities, physical realities. Um, I think it's also very interesting um, research to read. Um, well, also, if you have a link on the research or some more information, please feel free to also put it in the chat so that we can see it. And uh, again, for everybody, the invitation to share questions either in the chat or in the in the Menti. And you can, of course, uh, also use the, the reactions and the emoticons uh, to see and to, to react on, on the different inputs we have. Thanks a lot for this uh, at the first uh, moment. Uh, maybe also to link a bit this topic on culture as realities um, and maybe to link it to AI. Uh, I would uh, invite Pano to give us a short intervention on this more on this uh, practical connection um, to, uh, to try to find a bit of a connection to realities, physical realities and culture. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh... I will share my slides. Um, now I have the rights to do it. 
So here we go. Um, as uh, Palash told that there are uh, segregation between uh, different uh, in social media between uh, people who are poor or rich and it, it comes from the neighborhood that they are living. Uh, I chose for the first part to uh, talk about a bit of, about bias of uh, AI and how how the bias uh, affects in uh, different uh, AI tools. Because I consider it's really interesting how the culture and uh, where we live affects to, to AI. So first things first, so AI isn't anything new. It's everywhere and it's been there for past 25 years at least. When you consider uh, different search engine, engines, uh, social media, entertainment, education, all the navigation tools and so on, so on. So every AI has some kind of bias and the bias means that uh, AI isn't uh, possible to always give the correct answer in, in, a, uh, in a sense like uh, if we ask the AI write us a speech, uh, it, uh, it's probable that it doesn't understand to write it in on your own uh, cultural context. So uh, why we started talking about uh, AI was that when the first uh, this kind of text to image generators game and, and we had the possibility to see what the actual bias is. And, and when, when this same bias is uh, basically in every AI system, we started uh, promoting these kind of uh, text to image uh, tools uh, that finally we have possibility to determine uh, what, what's the uh, bias is. So in just two, Years we have had huge leaps that that uh, on these systems, and it's becoming more clear that that uh, uh, how the bias affects on these images, and all of these images are in the cultural context of uh, this kind of you uh, American way. It's not. In, in a sense, if you uh, ask AI to make some kind of image, it's, it reflects always uh, to the material that it's trained. And the bias can be this kind of stereotypical bias about uh, this, these images for made in uh, made with mid journey about a couple on a Sunday walk. And the AI immediately thinks that it should be in a park. It should be about this elderly couple. It should be uh, in, in Western countries. So, so apparently AI cannot uh, think in anything, uh, anyone else to walk, to have a Sunday walk, or it cannot happen in any, any other circumstances. So, this is just like stereotypical bias, but there are also racial and cultural bias. And I made this that kind of Finnish Barbie doll, like uh, what <laughs> does Finnish Barbie doll look? At? And all of a sudden it's with, uh, you know, blonde hair, it's young, uh, it, the, uh, the clothes are, you know, in, in some ways, custom uh, traditional clothes. But the fact is that even we Finns have, you know, dark hair and, and we, we don't dress in these kind of traditional clothes. And apparently those aren't even uh, Finnish traditional clothes. So, so 
these all are kind of racial and cultural bias. It uh, it works with what the AI uh, data uh, model has been trained with, and uh, the outcome uh, reflects on that. So when you uh, think about uh, how the models are trained, it's basically uh, gathered from the internet. Like it's, they have taken it all, <laughs> that all the possible data that they have uh, managed to get. And, and uh, most of the data from the internet is, done in in western countries and and the, most of the data um, is written in english on the internet so the smaller minorities uh, from culture or race or uh, language isn't coming to uh, to these models so when you are asking chatgpt to tell you a joke it, it's it's horrible. I haven't laughed any, any time because the cultural context of those jokes are completely different uh, when you're comparing it to, to the Finnish way. So, so even um, in the social media, as Palash told that uh, just to small neighborhoods, if there's some uh, railroads or rivers between the, the different cities, the social media uh, acts differently. So in a, in a way, this this is one way to put a bias. The uh, material, what we use to train these models uh, is, uh, in, in, in a sense, it's corrupt because it's not equal because everybody isn't uh, providing to these data sets that they are uh, training these models. So well, what we can do is that we should have really diverse material to uh, train these data sets. We should have better training for them and we should have actually uh, better regulation how the models are trained and how uh, how we should be able to see the bias and, and we should also uh, have to have a right to um, you know somehow see how the bias effects are on this every AI system, not just in, in this text to image generators or uh, you know these kind of GBD models, but even in the social media background, <laughs> like how the social media channels are giving you the post to see how the social media is recommending new friends or so forth. So so. The bias is uh, one kind of um, um, this kind of uh, uh, invisible uh, um, threat that we have to acknowledge when we are using these kind of uh, AI tools. That's it for me <laughs> at this point. I will continue later on uh, with the next topic. Thank you also for this practical uh, connection and linking this topic on, on of uh, social networks and c cultures and also to AI development all, and also to the topic of um, uh, the, the cultural contexts and the, the training sets that uh, AI uses and also our knowledge about it. Um, I think that's also a nice link um, to our next uh, speaker uh, also connecting digital techniques, uh, civic participation and political dimensions. And uh, if you think about political uh, dimensions, uh, maybe that's also a topic where uh, AI is uh, quite uh, um, interesting at the moment. So I'm, I'm curious to see and to hear about research, your research results. And you're already with us, Cesar Hidalgo. And uh, maybe you will present yourself a bit and uh, 
Yeah. Well, Thank fine. you. Yeah, I just need to be able to share my screen and I can get started. So um, thank you very much, Elizabeth, for for the chance to be here. And uh, OK, now I'm co-host. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about a project that actually took several years you know, uh, to materialize, uh, but it started in, in a situation that was actually quite serendipitous. So it's a project about digital participation. It's a project about using, you know, tools to help organize, you know, uh, people's grievances during a mass mobilization that happened in 2019 and that eventually uh, resulted in, you know, scientific research that is helping us redefine certain ideas in the context of social choice theory, which is the theory that we use to aggregate preferences, a theory that has been around for a few hundred years and that thanks you know, to this event, we were able to make some contributions. So you might not know this, but on October of 2019, there was a massive mobilization in Chile that started more or less unexpectedly. On a Wednesday, everybody was going you know, uh, normally down the street, minding their own business. On a Thursday, a few students started to protest because there was an increase uh, on the subway price equivalent of a few cents. On Friday, the mobilizations grew. And on Saturday, people woke up to a country in which you know, uh, dozens of subway stations have been burned or damaged. You know, uh, then on Sunday, you know, we, uh, the country wakes up to uh, dozens of supermarkets uh, looted, burned, you know, and basically uh, the country descended into a state of chaos in a matter of a weekend. And everybody was uh, waiting for answers. Like, what is really going on? What is really on? Wh why, you know, uh, we went from something that seemed normal a few days ago into this state of chaos, you know? The first curfew was declared since the time of Pinochet in Chile. So it was, it was a big deal what happened on October of 2019. You know? And in that world, you know, uh, let me see, because I had to just accept someone and then it moved away from my presentation. Uh, stop the share and share again. Yeah. If someone comes in, maybe if I can get the help of a co-host to be able to manage the, the sharing. Okay, there. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Okay, so what happened? So what we had in Chile was a network social movement. A network social movement is a movement uh, that has been studied and that emerged relatively recently in events such as the Arab Spring you know, uh, in, in North of Africa at the beginning of last decade, the Dignaos movement in Spain, the Occupy movement in the United States. And these are movements you know, uh, that in general distrust political parties, they distrust traditional media, they reject formal organizations, and they reject traditional forms of leadership. And the result of that is that these movements fail to articulate grievances. You know, like when, when these movements happen, they're very good at getting people on the street, but they're very bad at telling us why. You know, what do these people want? You know, they're upset, they're burning stuff, they're breaking windows, but what do they really want? So at that time I was living in Boston and I asked myself, well, you know, I'm a Chilean, you know, how can I help? And what I had was a software company that had offices in Chile. And what we could do is we could do platforms that could organize, visualize data, maybe gather some participation. So the idea that we had is how about we build a collective intelligence platform that tries to find areas of consensus and brings us to a more constructive dialogue. You know, people were upset, they were shouting at each other, you know, there was violence on the streets. Maybe we can find a few things that people agree on that need to be improved, and maybe we can focus constructively on improving those things. You know, that was our idea. So we got to work, and we used, you know, uh, ideas from Leo's, uh, Louis Leon Thorston, who was an American psychologist and engineer that had created this method of comparative judgment that is a way to transform qualitative judgments into quantitative scales. And what you know, the law of comparative judgment does is that ask people to choose items in pairs. And in 1927, you know, he actually you know, developed this idea by having people choose you know, the crime that they consider the worst in, in a number of pair of crimes. And he could create a quantitative scale of how bad each one of these crimes was. So you could go from something that was ordinal, you know, just the order of the crimes to something that it's really cardinal that you get like 
a, a numeric representation, you get like a degree of difference between, you know, these judgments. And we had experience on that because uh, in 2010, you know, in my group at MIT, we had started working on quantifying people's perception of urban environments using that idea. So we've done many papers in which, you know, we had collected data on people's perception of cities by using, you know, uh, this methodology in which we would present the people with a pair of images, we asked them pe uh, people to click uh, in response to an evaluative question, and then we could use this, you know, not only to rate those images, but to then train machine learning models that would allow us to make like high resolution maps of uh, urban perception. So we, we knew the, the technique, but what we did not have, of course, was the candidate grievances. So at that moment on October 23rd, 2019, I went onto WhatsApp and, and I told people in this think tank that I participate, which involves a number of people that some of them have been former ministers, you know, people that have run the central bank in Chile and so forth, people that are very informed about policy. Uh, what are the things that, you know, people might be upset about? And we collected a list of like 90 proposals that then, you know, we built overnight into a digital participation platform that we launched on October 24, 2019, you know, from the basement of this company in Boston. So what happened is that the revolution was ongoing in Chile, you know, and the platform went viral, you know, like uh, this was a platform that was quite innovative and it allowed us to run over 4,000 simultaneous elections in parallel, you know, these are head to head elections that we could parallelize, you know, um, and also was a platform that it's a, a, a little bit hard to cheat on because every time you go in, you get a random pair of proposals. So you cannot just simply go there and vote on what you want. You're always forced on voting on alternatives that you cannot choose, you know, because you have over 4000 pairs and you don't get to choose over which, you know, pairs you, you are voting. So we launched this platform, you know, it went viral. Uh, we started to collect a lot of data and we started to see what were the things that, you know, people agreed on uh, were maybe behind the crisis or the things that people weren't happy about. You know, people wanted better, you know, pensions. Uh, they wanted to increase the minimum wage. They wanted to reduce the value added tax to medicines. They wanted universal healthcare insurance. And they didn't care, for instance, about the legalization of, mari uh, of marijuana or the modernization of libraries. So even though, you know, those were proposals that had low priority, they validated the fact that the mechanism was working. What was on the top was relevant and what was on the bottom was not relevant. You know? uh, so this platform was launched, as I told you, on October 24. First, we went viral, you know, on, on Twitter and, and other things. Then it appeared in the newspaper. And then like about like a week later, you know, we're in the cover of the news. You know, there are senators of the Republic <laughs> discussing the proposals on television, in the morning shows, you know. Are these the solutions to the country? Can this technology help us, you know, uh, solve this crisis? Of course, in the street, the crisis kept on going, you know, like mobilizations kept on growing, things were getting burned, you know, businesses were being destroyed, all of that stuff. And this started to circulate on television, you know, and as, as, as uh, the, the platform was shown on television, more and more and more people come. Until eventually everybody, of course, starts, you know, jumping at it. So like about week three, which to me was actually quite long, I thought that, you know, we we're going to die sooner. Uh, basically, everybody says like, no, this is all bias. It's not a solution. And people start getting upset when this becomes really poly, uh, politicized, you know, like the, the, the platform starts being used by politicians on the far right to say that, for instance, you know, the new constitution was not the reason for the mobilization because it was not the winner of this election that we were running online. So we had three great weeks, you know, and then everybody jump on top of us. And I ask myself, well, what's going on? You know, we created a platform to try to understand what were the things that people agreed on uh, were behind the discontent of the population. And we're able to find like reasonable things that had high levels of support. You know, for example, making the minimum pension equal or larger to the minimum wage was something that was getting like 70%, you know, uh, win rates on our platform, you know, but it's still, people, you know, uh, went against us. And, and I started wondering why. So maybe, you know, this idea of trying to find the things that people agreed on and uh, trying to engage in a constructive dialogue was a naive idea. You know? So uh, after, you know, we were taken down on November 7, 
And what I did is I, I, I had a little bit more time to look at the data and I created a different type of representation. Uh, in the platform, we had asked people to self-report uh, whether they consider themselves from the left or from the right. And in that self-report, you know, uh, we could use that to uh, split the population. So we could now take the data and we could say, this is the ranking among people that self-report in the right. And this is the ranking among people that self-report on the left. And there were like a few issues that people in the left and the right agree were important, you know? So this is the area of agreement. This is what we decide the platform for, you know? And we thought that the conversations were going to be about this. But there were other issues, for instance, here that were the number one issue in the ranking among people in the left, izquierda in Spanish, and they were the bottom among people on the right, you know? Like Asamblea Constituyente, like a constitutional assembly was literally the least preferred option by people that identify with the right. And it was a top five option among people that identify with the left. So what was going on is that, yes, there is a big area of agreement right here in the middle that people have more or less, you know, similar level of priorities, but there was, you know, a f there were a few items that had a huge disagreement, you know? Now, the problem is that we had done all of this out of the basement of this unit in Cambridge, Massachusetts, you know, uh, DataWheel, which is my software company. So we had done this as Chilean citizens, you know, working, uh, you know, privately, like basically, you know, using our, our right to free speech and communication and participation. But if we wanted to test this scientifically, we had to start over. We had to, you know, collect data again, using all of the protocols that are required for, you know, scientific experiments. So with my lab, we moved to Toulouse, you know, during COVID on 2020. And then eventually on 2022, we were able to launch two platforms uh, during the French presidential election and the Brazilian presidential election, you know? And these platforms experimented a little bit with the user interface design, but more or less they were uh, similar in terms of uh, the, the form of participation that they provided and the general idea. There was one important difference though, that uh, in Chile, we had used proposals that we first collected organically from a think tank. Then we collected you know, in the platform itself. But in France and in Brazil, we could do a little bit better. What we could do is we build a collaborative government program builder. So the proposals that we used were extracted from the official government program. So we had a lawyer, you know, Nicole Ferrada, that went through all of the government programs of the 12 candidates of the French election and transformed each one of these proposals into a little soundbite that then we could use in this participation platform. In the case of France, we had over 100 and you know, uh, we had 120 proposals to be exact. In the case of Brazil, it was something like 68. You know, so again, we had thousands of possible pairs of uh, proposals that were running in these elections. You know, uh, and this allowed us to then um, be able to rank. You know, the proposals that were preferred. In the case of France, among the population of participants, this is not among all French people, but among those that participated in the platform. You know, the idea of, for example, using 100% renewable energy by 2050, you know, had a lot of support. Increasing personnel in public hospital received a lot of support. Increasing the minimum wage, you know, developing the French nuclear park were all, you know, highly supported proposals, were popular proposals. You know, and then, for instance, the prohibition of the Burkini did not have a lot of support, was at the bottom of the ranking. In the case of Brazil, again, the minimum wage, also proposals about healthcare were on the top. We could also use this opportunity to now see if people from the left agree with the proposals from the candidates of the left, or if people on the right agree with the proposals in the candidates of the right, because we had separated the candidates from the proposals. So people were participating in proposals, but we knew which proposals came from which candidates. You know, uh, and we find, of course, you know, that there is an agreement, like people on the left are more likely to select a proposal from the left, people from the right are more likely to select a proposal from the right. In the case of Brazil, you see that diagonal element, you know, basically like 90% like agreement, but the off the diagonal elements are rather large, you know, this is not a very diagonal matrix, like basically a voter of Bolsonaro is like about three quarters, you know, likely to select a proposal from Lula and vice versa. In the case of France, among our population of participants, we find kind of like an interesting agreement, uh, uh, sorry, an interesting pattern, which is that uh, people from the right are more or less okay with proposals from the left, but people from the left 
are not okay with proposals from the right. So there's kind of like an asymmetry, you know, that we find among this population of participants. But what we could do is, of course, revisit our idea of divisiveness. That's, after all, what we're trying to understand. You know, um, for for both for for uh, the people here that are not familiar with social choice theory, social choice theory is you know a mathematical uh, theory that is used to aggregate preferences that has been uh, going for over 200 years is from prior to the French Revolution. And it always focused on this idea of agreements, the idea that we had used to start this platform in Chile. But now we have this idea of these agreements. And for instance, you know, we could see that in France, between the left and the right, there was some level of uh, agreement. Of course, there is a diagonal, there is a disagreement. But for instance, the idea of prohibiting salary difference of more than 1 to 20 in a company is something that people from the left want something that people from the right don't want as much, you know? So that's kind of like a lefty idea, we can say, you know? A restoration of border control by France leaving the Schengen Agreement, that's an idea from the right, not from the left. That's a righty idea, you know? But there are ideas, for instance, like, in, you know, putting more healthcare workers in rural areas that are both from the left and the right. They both agree on. We could also look at divisiveness through other dimensions. For instance, age. We could look at the participants that were younger than average, older than average, and for instance, you know, uh, reducing real estate tax, you know, that's something that older people care about. You know, the older you get, you accumulate property, the less you want to get taxed on it. That makes sense. So it validates the method. Uh, ending the 34-hour working week, so making the, the work week a little bit shorter here in France is something that was supported more by younger participants. In fact, divisiveness is a multidimensional phenomena. You know, uh, you can split people by left versus right, capital versus region, male versus female, young versus old, you know, and you find divisiveness across all of these dimensions. The political dimension, though, is the one that explains most of the divisiveness, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, you can find, let's say, two women that are 27 that are the same height, the same level of education, they look similar and so forth, and, you know, they have a lot of demographic characteristics similarly, but they could think very differently. One could be very right wing, that one could be left wing. Demographic, you know, attributes actually do not express as much devices, uh, divisiveness as ideology. But what was interesting about this is that we could also generalize this idea of divisiveness and determine it without the need of any demographic characteristic. So we came up with a little formula, you know, that averages over multiple splits of the population that tries to estimate how much, you know, a proposal splits the population into groups that otherwise would have different sets of preferences. So we don't know if this is left, right. We don't know if this is, you know, uh, old or young, we don't care. We're just trying to split the population into two the best that we can. And we're trying to find which are the proposals that is split the population into two the best. And we can do this for any voting rule, for any way to aggregate votes. So this is a very general idea. And what we find is that these measures of divisiveness are actually orthogonal. They're uncorrelated with these win percentage measures or the board account or the Condorcet winner with the measures that we use to aggregate uh, preferences. So what we discovered here is that we have a new way to aggregate data in elections involving multiple proposals that is completely uncorrelated with all of the ways in which we have aggregated preferences before that don't tell us which proposal should win an election, but tell us which are the proposals that are more likely to divide the electorate and therefore receive more pushback. So let me give you an example. Like here in France, there's a proposal that was ranked number 11 and another one that was ranked number 14. So if you think of that ranking as a level of approval, you can say, well, these are both proposals that among this population of participants, they got a lot of approval. Being 11 out of 120 or 14 out of 120, you had a lot of approval. You had like over 60% you know, of your contests, you, know, uh, you were selected over others. But option number 11 here, to create a constitutional assembly to pass the Sixth Republic has a lot of pushback. It's very divisive. You know, so it's in that position number 11, because some people really want it, but also some people really hate it. Option, you know, number 14, increasing the number of uh, um, uh, doctors in rural underserved areas. That's a proposal, you know, that has a similar level of overall support, but there's no people that is really against it. So it's not going to face that much 
pushback. So in this first dimension, in the election, they will look the same, but in reality, they're very different. And you need this divisiveness metric you know, to know the difference, to know the level of pushback that they're going to get. In Brazil, the same thing, proposal 29 and 30, you know, if you look at just the ranking of, of approval or support, they would look the same, the same fraction of support, but very different type of support, you know, support that is, you know, much more fragmented and divided. So this came out uh, recently in a paper that we published on nature, human behavior. So you're interested kind of like on the whole, you know, methodology and data and, and, and all of that, you can check it out there. Um, but to make a long story short, you know, we started this with the idea that we could build a collective intelligence platform to find areas of consensus and support a constructive dialogue, you know, and that's a beautiful idea, like the, uh, the road to hell is paved on good intentions, no, they say. So we had good intention. We said, oh, we find things that people agree on. We can have the people that disagree on talk about the things that people agree on, you know. And what we realized that what was driving the revolution was not the things that people told us was important. We asked people, what would you prioritize in this moment on crisis? And they told us, you know, and we found those things that the people would prioritize. And those things were not the right answer. So not even people knew the right answer because it was not about the things that people thought they were upset about. You know, it was not about better wages, pensions, or things that people agreed on were high priority. You know, what was driving the reform, uh, sorry, the, the mobilization, was their disagreement about a topic, you know? So this was not a topic that was universally important. It was a topic that was important only for some and was detested by other ones, you know? And that disagreement could not be detected by the voting rules. If you ask people what is driving the revolution, you know, you get the constitution to be like number 20 overall in the ranking, you know, because it's never gonna rise to the top because it's an issue that has pushback. And the pushback is the one that explains this friction. That's why there's so much friction. If people would be rallying around the things that people agreed on, like, you know, minimum wage or better pensions, you know, this wouldn't have been the type of mobilization that we observe. It would have been much more civil, probably. You know? But this uh, um, issue that was dividing the population could be observed, could be understood once we figure out how to estimate divisiveness. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time and happy to move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks Cesar for this uh, interesting and very emotional uh, connection and topic and, and for this applied um, uh, social choice theory and the, the digital technology that, that you used for it and that how, how it worked. Also the risk you mentioned and uh, the political dimension and the correlations connected to that. Also for you, if you have some information or some links in the chat, please feel free to, to, to share it anytime uh, in, in the webinar. Um, maybe uh, once again, a connection to AI uh, and political dimension very strong uh, uh, in your um, information is right now maybe again Pano uh, from the center of expertise for digital youth work <laughs> so because it was not presented yet uh, maybe to uh, link uh, the political dimension uh, to AI and give us some more information on that yeah thank you uh, really interesting uh, topic from the Cesar it was Mind blowing. Thank you. Uh, one thing that we have already seen uh, in, in the media is that uh, these great tools that we have, uh, these generative AI tools, have been already used in, in uh, political influence. And uh, we have already seen Pope wearing Adidas and, and uh, Trump being uh, used, uh, arrested in, in New York, uh, which didn't happen in, in that way. <laughs> and, and here in Finland, we, uh, we just had uh, this uh, uh, campaign from Russia that they brought us uh, refugees or uh, asylum seekers to our borders. And after that, our uh, far right uh, politicians started uh, making these kind of pictures uh, of uh, uh, Red Cross workers, you know, feeding the 
these refugees. So these kind of images, the, the only purpose for them is to affect on, on, on the political mindset of their voters. So these are uh, used as a way that finally they they are making it uh, pictures that they would like to see that they are completely false, but they the uh, they are using it in like right wing populist way because they don't haven't had any actual proof that this kind of thing has happened. Now they have a tool to make it happen, and the same thing is with the text. So uh, I made this shocking article about Trump using uh, narcotics, other narcotics substances, and, and this was made with ChatGPT. So every tool can be used in, in, in a way to affect uh, to uh, readers' political mindset. And uh, actually, I went a bit further and I asked ChatGPT that how could I do a bot network that would publish these kind of texts to multiple different platforms. And the ChatGPT was polite enough to, uh, for me to tell me to, uh, how to code this kind of application to set up your own bot uh, network. So things are done uh, really easy for uh, this kind of political influencing. Uh, I will skip this video to give in uh, the time, but the thing is that we can have any uh, politician's voice or image captures and used as uh, against him. So, so we can make politicians say anything. And this was actually already done in, in Slovakia just, uh, just this uh, autumn. Uh, there were this deep fake video about a political candidate that uh, the right-wing parties were trying to uh, put him say stuff that wasn't about his uh, political background. In, in France, uh, one candidate uh, used uh, AI image of herself to, <laughs> to, uh, as a candidacy picture. And uh, on... Uh, on Finland, we had uh, parliamental elections on spring. And uh, after that, we are call, calling those elections our first TikTok elections because the TikTok uh, had so much effect on, on youngsters' uh, electional behavior. Basically, what they all, all the material they saw on TikTok was the right wing. Uh, party members making public speeches and so on. So these tools are already in action. And in, in youth work, we are coming like, you know, two years too late for this. And next year, we are going to have uh, our presidential election here in Finland. And we are having, uh, on summer, we are, are having European parliamental election. So you might wonder how much these kind of tools are going to be used in, in, in these elections. But I let the next speaker to talk and, and I will continue after that again. It's nice to always have some, have you uh, on board in between to give a short intervention and also connecting AI and the topics uh, we were listening to uh, and seeing different uh, angles and uh, also discussing a bit the realities of what we are in. Um, once again, before I will, uh, I would like to also open the space and give uh, some the place to uh, Irina to uh, connect to that and to maybe also address concerns connected to AI uh, and adding to the topics we were discussing already. Uh, once again, I know we are we have uh, intense uh, topics and quite intense uh, talks. Uh, still, uh, I would like to, to um, again remind you, uh, questions are warmly welcome, uh, comments are warmly welcome, and 
anything that connects to our today's topic. But then with that, Irina, your space. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Irina. I do emerging tech research and policy analytics and currently working as a government advisor in Moldova on artificial intelligence. I got really immersed in the prior presentations by my colleagues, and it made me uh, acknowledge for the millionth time, I think, uh, that we live in a very interesting reality today. And since I will be talking about digital uh, transfer, digital participation, and how it can be transformed uh, by a, a triad of technologies. Um, I kind of want to put a bit of a different spin on it. And uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to do a bit of an imagination exercise. So imagine a world where voting booths are augmented with immersive simulations of policy proposals, where AI chatbots can guide you through complex government processes with genuine empathy, and where social networks don't just connect us, but they empower us to collaborate and solutions for our communities. And this isn't science fiction, this is the very foreseeable future of our civic engagement, shaped by the powerful triad of network science, artificial intelligence, and augmented reality. So the lines between virtual and tangible are, are very, very blurred today. And with it, I think that the very fabric of our democratic engagement is, well, sort of undergoing a profound transformation, let's say. And as we navigate this digital horizon, I think that we must be ready to explore how this trial of technologies is reshaping the landscape of civic involvement, participation, and guides us to, uh, towards a more inclusive, participatory, and informed digital democracy. So when it comes to the trial of, of transformation, as I call it, uh, we're going to explore today uh, those three, three types of technologies, uh, network science, augmented reality, and artificial intelligence. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so net network science uh, once was confined to solely the academic research papers and is now wielding an incredibly powerful tool uh, as in mapping the intricate web of our social connections. So imagine a map, not of land or sea, but of the invisible connections that bind us online. Network science really helps to paint this picture by well, revealing the intricate web of likes, shares, and comments that form the digital landscape that we live in. And by analyzing these networks, as, as we've seen in the uh, prior presentation today, we can uncover the hidden patterns, we can identify echo chambers that amplify biases and isolate communities that are really earning for a voice. And armed with this knowledge, what we can do is that we can bridge the digital divide, we can ensure that no voice is lost in the cacophony of the, of the online discourse. When it comes to augmented reality, for example, which I feel that once was very limited to futuristic gadgets, it is now very much poised to basically overlay information onto the world around us by blurring the lines between uh, reality and digital augmentation. So for example, imagine an AR app that lets you uh, say, visualize the impact of proposed budget cuts on your uh, local park by empowering you to participate in informed decision-making. Or imagine a gamified uh, civic challenge, for example, where citizens can uh, point to uh, can earn points and uh, earn badges for volunteering, turning community service into captivating adventures. And now picture this. You can raise just your smartphone, uh, and the park across the street from you transforms. You have budget proposals that kind of just dance before your eyes. Uh, their impact visualized in vibrant hues. Or imagine volunteering becoming a thrilling treasure hunt. So AI, uh, AR can guide you really through uh, hidden tasks and reward you with badges for community pride. What AR really does, it basically injects magic into the mundane by turning civic engagement in, from a chore to, uh, to a captivating adventure, one that transcends the limitations of the physical world. Now, when it comes to AI, uh, which was once very much uh, relegated to science fiction movies, but now is completely infiltrating and transforming our daily lives. In the realm of civic engagement, it's potential, I feel that its potential is truly, truly revolutionary. So remember the days when sifting through mountains of government data took you an incredible amount of time and effort. What AI does today, it basically ushers a new dawn where personalized information can find you and not the other way around. Imagine an AI assistant that tirelessly uh, is your companion in the digital democracy. It can anticipate your questions, it can surface relevant policy discussions, um, it can also uh, connect uh, you to like-minded individuals for collaborative action. And what AI 
really does. It empowers you to be an informed, engaged citizen and not just a passive bystander. Sure, uh, AI has a lot of more uh, implications when it comes to digital participation. I will just pinpoint a few and then uh, leave over to you to, to, to go into this a, a bit further. So for example, AI can, we can use AI to uh, have AI um, powered recommendation systems. We can do AI chatbots. We can have AI powered sentiment analysis. All of this can build into a personalized information and advocacy campaign. We can also use machine learning algorithms to analyze behavior and predict which individuals are more likely to participate in online and offline civic activities. We can have AI-driven campaigns. We can have predictive models that could anticipate potential turnout uh, of people for voting or something like that. We can also use AI to power translation tools. Uh, to uh, enhance accessibility features and so on and so forth. There's very, very many ways in which artificial intelligence can be used. But despite the landscape that these technologies paint, uh, this digital landscape isn't just about convenience, let's say, right? It's also about connection. And this is what we're talking about today. So AR empowers us to visualize complex data, weaving narratives uh, that bridge the gap between abstract and real. Uh, imagine really watching uh, your vote like literally ripple through uh, through a network its impact on policy visualization in real time so this newfound tangibility uh, fosters a sense of community reminding us that even behind the usernames and avatars that we have on social media for example there are real people driving the change so the implications of this technological revolution are very vast uh, and we can envision a future where inclusivity thrives which means that digital tools can bridge geographical barriers, they can empower uh, marginalized communities and break down the walls of traditional participation. Uh, we have engagement that explodes, which means that gamification, for example, and personalization transforms civic duty from a chore to a captivating experience by drawing in a wider spectrum of voices. Our decisions get smarter. So we have data-driven insights from network analysis and artificial intelligence that can really empower policymakers to allocate resources efficiently and also address citizen concerns effectively. And the divisiveness diminishes uh, sometimes well. As for example, AI-powered discourse analysis can flag toxic language and promote respectful dialogue, uh, therefore fostering a more civil and, let's say, collaborative online environment. But of course, this digital utopia isn't without its hurdles. So we must be really aware and we must acknowledge that uh, there, is a there is a potential for the digital divide and that we need to ensure equitable access to technology and bridge the gap for those that are less fortunate. Uh, we must also safeguard data privacy by building robust security measures and fostering trust in how uh, our information is used. We must be vigilant against the potential misuse of, of uh, these powerful technological tools. Uh, for example, by ensuring that AI algorithms are unbiased and uh, augmented reality experiences don't manipulate uh, our perceptions. But these challenges aren't insurmountable, at least in my opinion. Uh, I believe that there are opportunities to build responsible frameworks, uh, to develop ethical guidelines and inclusive solutions. Uh, to me, they are more like calls to action uh, to us who are the, the architects of the digital democracy and to ensure that technology uh, empowers and doesn't disenfranchise. So this is really where the role of SALTO and European Solidarity Corps is incredibly important as it plays a cru crucial role in supporting digital participation, for example, by providing resources and tools for online volunteering and vir virtual solidar solidar solidarity projects, uh, by developing and providing resources on digital participation, digital citizenship, uh, participatory decision-making, educational materials, so critical thinking, media literacy, by promoting participation in democratic life through digital channels and so, so much more. So uh, just to conclude and be mindful of the time, I feel that the future of civic involvement is not predetermined. It's actually being shaped right now by each of us. So I invite everyone to embrace the transformative potential of network science, AI and AR, uh, not just as tools, but really as, as catalysts for a more inclusive, participatory and informed democracy. And I invite everyone to, to explore, experiment and collaborate uh, by building a digital landscape where every voice is heard, every idea is considered and every citizen feels, feels empowered to shape the future that they deserve. Thank you very much. And Elizabeth, over to you. Thank you. A uh, lot of thoughts and uh, thanks for this. Yeah, this former science fiction uh, 
moving to real life and and uh, all the implications that it that brings to us. Uh, so very very important topics discussing today. And maybe this is the link also partner to you to to round up uh, implications and uh, maybe also uh, there is a question in the menti I will put in the chat. So for those who feel uh, like uh, answering. Uh, please do so. And maybe Pano is also a bit connected to what you are going to do to link it a bit to our responsibility and uh, uh, um, the, these implications we also have to take. Yes, thank you uh, once again. Uh, so uh, the last segment, uh, what, what I consider now is that detecting the usage of an AI is a new civic skill. And uh, all, all of the stuff uh, Irina mentioned was just perfect music to my ears because, we, you know, utilizing these tools to goop is, is, is vital. We have to support our democracy. And, and I believe that these tools can, um, can maintain it. But the thing is, that uh, if we don't understand how these systems work, it can be also used uh, to, uh, you know, to influence our political mindset. We can, you know, uh, use them against democracy uh, also. So we have to learn how to read. So. I'm using these kind of uh, text to image generators uh, in a way to clarify this thought that every tool has still its own unique uh, way to make these images. So so has if if you've done uh, lots of text with ChatGPT, you can in in the end you can find out like okay this text has been generated with ChatGPT because there are some mishaps that you can notice after a while you have uh, used these tools. And one thing with, with these uh, text to image generators is that the hands are pretty bit, bit tricky for them because we are not in every picture showing our hands or we are, you know, putting our hands to our pockets or they are, you know, somehow invisible or partly invisible. So, so hands are really tricky for AI. Uh, it's getting better, but they are still, you know, this kind of freakishly many fingered <laughs> uh, persons or the fingers are missing or there are multiple limbs. But yeah, we are getting there. And th this is getting harder to, uh, to notice where, where uh, AI has been used. But when we still have the chance to uh, talk about this and getting familiar with the AI and, and probably with uh, mishaps, uh, we we still have a chance to fight uh, against the, the bad ways of uh, using AI. But the thing is, we have to use it. We have to use it a lot to getting familiar with these tools. So there are a few ideas uh, from Finland how AI has been used in everyday youth work. So, so they have been making these greeting cards uh, with AI. They have been making uh, comic books. They have been uh, imagining their uh, Dungeons and Dragons characters <laughs> with AI. So, so using these tools is one way to approach this. Uh, how can we actually start reading them? And what, what is the, the uh, uh, message in, inside them? So use it, use it a lot. And, you know, the thing is that we don't have to be in, in a youth field like teachers or youth workers or so forth. We don't have to be AI experts because the technology education 
belongs to everyone. I'm, for for instance, I'm not an engineer or doctor or anything like that. I'm a youth worker. My background is in youth field. I've been working for 15 years in youth work, but I'm really interested about the civic society. I'm really interested about AI and robotics and so on. So what we have to do is start talking about this. We just have to ask youngsters like, okay, what kind of AIs have we been using today? What are the, you know, what what's the best uh, AI picture generator at this point, or something like that? So, what we have to have is to facilitate uh, meaningful conversations and be interested about these kind of new tools and try them out with youngsters. It's not completely bad, and we we don't have to talk about it's horrible or you know stuff like that. We have to have the uh, facts, and we have to you know point out uh, all the, uh, and and uh, point out the truth. But thank you uh, from from my end, and it was really nice to be here talking to you about AI. Thank you from our side also for the interventions in between uh, and also the connecting um, elements. The very interesting talks, uh, also Cesar, Irina, um, and Balash. Uh, thanks for this uh, very diverse uh, connections, the implications of digital technologies, uh, about social networks, about AI, and about the realities we are in, and the challenges we have to face. A huge topic that uh, we could continue quite a while actually to discuss and um, learn more about. And as you said, Pano, to try it and also to work with our uh, audiences, with the young people, with the people we are uh, we are surrounded with to learn. Thanks for today's uh, webinar uh, for the very interesting topics. Um, so. My um, task now is to close um, and to uh, wish you a good afternoon. Uh, before you leave, I would warmly invite you for a short feedback. <clears throat> and uh, maybe we can have the link for the feedback in the chat. And meanwhile, please also, there is a question in the chat still. And I don't know, Cesar, if you saw it, uh, it was- it Yeah, I, I saw it and, and Ilse is a friend and colleague. So I, I the, the quick answer is that one way to make this type of platforms collect data that is representative is, yes, you, you, you can throw a little bit of money to the problem and, and hire a polling company that would try to get a probabilistic sample. Probabilistic samples, I understand that they are quite challenging because the non-response rates tend to be high. You know, people don't answer service on the phone or you know, as much as they used to in the past, you know, uh, but it is possible to do it as at least as good as you would do other type of polling, but with this different technique. And the difference between these and polling is that in a traditional poll, you can say yes to everything, but here you have to reveal trade-offs by making those choices. So in principle, yes, you know, it, it, it's something that you can do. A other way of doing this is to create a citizen assembly that would be designed to be representative through probabilistic sampling and then run this in the assembly. And we're actually, you know, talking with some colleagues in, in Finland, uh, you know, to, to do this type of experiments. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Try uh, trying to answer a quite complex questions <laughs> in, in a very short moment. Thanks for that. Um, yes, the, the evaluation form is in the chat, so please um, take a short moment of time and to also for us as a feedback, also for the upcoming webinars. And maybe this is also uh, my last word to say. Um, there is a next webinar, the last one for this year. It will take place in a week at the the fourteenth of December. And the topic, and maybe this is also connected to one of the questions that was uh, raised in the Mentimeter. Um, the, the topic will be supporting youth participation and volunteering, and can it impact the 2024 European elections? So again, the connection to the political dimension, 
maybe we can also use some of the knowledge we gained from today's webinar to discuss it next week. Thanks everybody. Thanks for the very interesting topics. Thanks for the nice hosting and uh, thanks for you to listen and hopefully you can take some interesting information with you for this afternoon. Enjoy. See you hopefully next week. Thank you.